Hello and welcome everybody to today's live video call from a dinosaur dig site. My name is Chris Smith. I'm the coordinator for current science programs here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and I'll be your host as we chat with museum paleontologists who are working in the field right now in a dinosaur quarry. Uh, these special presentations give us the chance to meet the paleontologists as they're working in the field out west. We get to hear about the latest updates from the field season. They've been working out there for several weeks now across New Mexico, Utah, and now Montana in the Hell Creek Formation. Let me introduce the three paleontologists we've got on the program today. Eric Lund is the paleontology lab manager for the museum. Haviv Avrahami is a doctoral student at North Carolina State University and works in the paleontology lab at the museum. And they have a visiting scientist with them, it looks like, out in the field, Alessandro Chiarenza. Hello. Thanks for being here. Looks like a gorgeous day where you're at. It is a beautiful day, considering yesterday was really rainy. <laughs> so we hit it just right. We've had really great weather for all of our live video calls and updates from the field. We got lucky. Oh, that's great. And this is no exception. Beautiful day here in Montana. So you're out in Montana. Uh, where are you in Montana? Yeah, so pretty much the middle of nowhere, Montana. In a, uh, <laughs> we're standing in a formation called the Hell Creek Formation, uh, which is a, a formation that was deposited right at the end of the time of the dinosaurs. So this formation spans about 3 million years, from 69 million years ago right to the end of the dinosaur time at 66 million years ago. Okay, fascinating. Well, we'll have to get into more uh, into that some more during our chat. But I see you've got some other folks with you there. Uh, can you tell us who's there on the team? I do. I have a doctoral PhD student, uh, uh, Haviv Avrahami. Hey, what's up? And I have Dr. Uh, Ali Kirenza. Hi, how's it going? Thanks for joining us, uh, Haviv and Ali. It's great that uh, to have you on the program. Yeah, it's great to be on. Great to be here. So, okay. Eric, you're out in Montana, you're at Hell Creek, a special place for looking for ancient life from this really uh, special period. Uh, why in particular go to Montana to the Hell Creek? Yeah, so uh, we're sort of interested in uh, what is happening in North America during the mid to late Cretaceous. And here in Montana, like I said, we're right at the end. So when we started uh, this year, we started uh, way back in May. So we've had a team out in the field since May, uh, and we've sort of moved uh, up through time. So we started out uh, way back about 100 million years ago. And now, like I said, we're standing just about 66 million years ago. Uh, so we moved through time, and we're interested in what final changes and environmental changes were happening during this time. So we've come to Montana specifically this year to dig up a baby Triceratops. So right now we're sort of standing in the quarry uh, of a baby Triceratops. Um, and this site was found last year. Uh, and we didn't even know uh, this baby Triceratops was here. What first uh, located this site was a small crocodiliform, small crocodile that was eroding out of the hill. And so we collected that. And in collecting that, we started finding other bones. And as we got into it, we realized it was a part of a baby Triceratops. <clears throat> Shout outs to my friend, Matt Joyce. He, he's the one who found it. He's listening. <laughs> that is in, uh, yeah, yeah. Shout outs. Great, great find. You found a baby Triceratops. Do you, uh, I'm imagining you don't find very many baby dinosaurs when you go digging. No, uh, we don't. Um, here in the Hell Creek, we do find quite a few pieces of Triceratops, but to find one that is a juvenile or baby is quite rare. So we're really excited about this site. So if you're working on uh, excavating it now, like sitting there in the quarry, it, it looks, I see tools laying around and all kinds of stuff like that. How do you know that you've got a baby Triceratops? Yep, so uh, the initial elements that we collected, the initial bones we collected last year, 
um, we could tell uh, what part of the body they were from. So we got an upper arm bone and we got one of the hip bones. And uh, based off of their shape, we knew it was a triceratops. And then based off of its size, we knew it was a baby. So the humerus we collected is only about uh, this big, about a foot long, whereas an adult triceratops arm would have been about two feet long. Fascinating. And about how big do you think the whole animal would have been? Or like, do you, how much of the skeleton do you have there? And then how big would it have been in life? Yep. So, so far, we've been able to uncover uh, an upper jawbone, a maxilla. We've uncovered both of the upper leg bones, the femora. We have a whole bunch of different ribs. Uh, we found the other arm bone, the other humerus. Uh, we have something that may be part of the snout or the premaxilla. So we're actually uncovering quite a bit of this animal. And based off of the size of these things, sort of extrapolate that from tip of snout to tip of tail would have been about three to four feet long. Uh, so a little guy compared to a fully grown adult triceratops, which is around 16 to 20 feet long from tip of snout to tip of tail. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's so like, impressive. That, that is so cool. Yeah, Sorry, exactly. go ahead. Yeah, so uh, Javi just asked if it was about dog size. So think about, you know, large German shepherd or something, big dog, uh, sort of sized animal. That is so cool. That That's quite the update as we <laughs> near the end of the field season. Yeah, it's been great. We didn't know how much was here. So we opened up a big area and we're very excited that almost every day we found new bones uh, as we're going down through, through the rock. So what has been uh, some of the other exciting things you've come across or, or been working on out there at the Hell Creek? And I'd love to go around and hear from like each one of you uh, what the work's been like. Well, with Ale, because on, on day one, he found something really cool and kind of funny. Right. Okay. <laughs> One of, one of the thing, one of the interesting things of these areas is that all around there is a dark band of rocks. These dark band of rocks correspond to the event of the extinction. We know it because if we analyze the chemistry of these rocks, uh, you find minerals from space. And these minerals may only have come with a giant asteroid when 66 million years ago hit the, an area in Mexico, basically causing all the mayhem that was the extinction. And these rocks, this layer of rock, it's, I would say, around 60 feet above where we are now. So one interesting thing is that whatever we found here, it's basically all the last animals that lived before the big extinction. So you find things that died out, like other dinosaurs. Uh, you find the remains, but also, as Avi was hinting, you find also the dropping. So I did find a coprolite, which is a technical term for uh, basically a dinosaur dung. <laughs> and it's very cool because it has all the shapes and everything preserved, all the impressions from the intestine. So that means that you can also reconstruct not only things about the, its diet, but also the shape of its inner organs that because they're soft, they usually don't preserve. But another thing is that you find lots of animals that live with the dinosaurs, some of which didn't get extinct. So you got lots of remains of crocs, you got lots of remains of turtles. Uh, I have some here, which I just collected this morning. They look like something like this. So I don't know if you can see it. This is basically an osteoderm. So one of these bones from the shell of a turtle. And as you can see, it basically looks almost like a modern day turtle, maybe bigger. And you find crocs, you, can, you find fish, you find all the other dino, uh, tiny dinosaurs. All that live together. And some of these animals went extinct 66 million years ago. Others reached out uh, throughout the last 66 million years ago and live with us today. That is amazing. Thanks for, for bringing it up to the camera, Avi. You're welcome. And that I'll, looks uh, awesome. I, I think I also found uh, day one at the same time, like I found a, a T Rex tooth. So I think, is that like our fifth or sixth one for the museum or something? Yeah. Out we've, here? we found uh, so dinosaurs shed their teeth throughout their life. And teeth preserve really well because of the enamel and just the way they're constructed. So oftentimes as we're walking out around here, we find what's called a microsite. 
uh, which is a collection of a bunch of different animals. And some of these things that Ollie mentioned are from these sort of microsite assemblages. Uh, but uh, what Haviv was mentioning was a, a tyrannosaur tooth. And just so happened uh, the same day I found another one as well. Um, so we find a lot of dinosaur teeth out here uh, from all different sorts of taxa, tyrannosaurs, uh, triceratops, hadrosaurs, because um, they just get mixed in with the system. And so we find, find a lot of them. From this particular quarry, one of the cool things that we've been finding is, uh, besides dinosaurs is plant material. So we've been able to find a lot of little seeds uh, and some uh, wood material and some plant hash, which is kind of fun. Wood, did you say plant ash? Uh, uh, plant like, hash. Like charcoal. It's like, like, uh, it's like carbonized yeah, charcoal. Yeah, carbonized plant material. Okay, okay, I've got you. If, uh, that's wild. That it sounds like a pretty uh, successful few days in the field so far, or a few weeks. Oh, it has been, yeah. Yeah, great. We've only been here uh, not quite a week yet, I guess. Kind of lose track of time when you're out here. Uh, but yeah, it's been very successful. So, Haviv, I, I know you're working on your doctorate. Uh, yeah. What are you hoping to find when you go out in the field? Um, well, this time period isn't specifically related to my PhD thesis. It's okay. uh, a little later, right? This is 66. And the, the critters that I worked on are from 100 million years ago, uh, around that time period. So, um, but, but, uh, out, like before we came out here, we were in the Cedar Mountain Formation. So I was working at a site with another um, Orodromi. And those are like these small dog-sized plant-eating dinosaurs that were, ran on two feet. Um, and so, and they probably dug burrows. So, uh, but there are animals that are related to Orodromians out here called Fesclosaurs. Uh, and we have one of them at the museum. If anybody knows Willow, uh, the big Fesclosaurus, right, in an exhibit, uh, it's like the, the world's best Fesclosaurus. So. Um, they're really closely related. I would love to find one of those out here. Uh, but we're at, for whatever reason, there's not a lot of their material in the location that we are. I've only found a few teeth before, so not quite sure why. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Uh, Eric, what about you? Anything that you're still hoping to find? Yeah, well, my specialty is horned dinosaurs, so I'm really happy working on this baby triceratops. Um, but specifically from this quarry, I'd like to find the brow horns on this thing, which we don't have yet. Um, there was something uh, last year that I thought might be a brown horn, uh, but we haven't quite gotten down to it again. Um, we put a cap on it and we're slowly sort of working the rock down to get to it so we can look at it better. Um, but yeah, I, I always enjoy finding uh, more horned dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, do, you, do we know that such a young triceratops would have had the the distinctive horns we do we do so if anyone's ever been to the museum of the rockies they're in bozeman they have a beautiful ontogenetic series or growth series of triceratops from a really tiny baby whose skull is only about 20 centimeters long that has little tiny nubbins above its eyes uh, all the way to full-grown triceratops that have the the big meter long uh, horns um, so based off of the size of this animal, we know that its orbital horns would have been somewhere uh, around 50 centimeters, about a foot long, something like that. Um, so not not huge, but they would have had them. Wow, that's amazing. Really amazing stuff. Uh, and Ale, what about you? Anything in particular that uh, that you're hoping to find out on the dig? So one of the reasons why we're here is not just to dig up this triceratops, it's also to look at these microfossils that I was hinting earlier. The mm. reason is because it's a big fossils preserved in a way, and we can see here these big bones being preserved in this uh, hard rock. It's called mudstone, which is mud, which is petrified. But unfortunately, these kind of sediments don't preserve very tiny animals. That is important because we miss a lot of the diversity of the animals, of the critters that were living around the dinosaurs or, you know, underneath dinosaur feet. And so one important aspect for us is sampling these microsites, which are these uh, channel lags, which contain lots of mixture of different bones and different teeth or different scutes and other elements that were shed by these animals while dying. 
And these oftentimes in a small area of few centimeters, you, you do find three, four, five, six different species. And so the richness in this number of species can help us understand how the fauna, how the animals on the planet in this particular area were changing towards those series of climatic changes that eventually uh, led to the final extinction when the hashrate hit. And so we can have a, a prettier picture of the ecosystems at a large scale, what it was looking here when T-Rex uh, was hunting uh, Triceratops. And so we can understand better what the diversity was, how it changed and how it eventually got extinct and how some critters eventually led to us now and and the, <clears throat> that's actually like the finding some of those microsites is actually the, like one of the main missions of uh being out here in montana this year because it's associated with our cretaceous creatures program if you know if anybody knows about that it's, it's the the museum there's a mu new program we're starting out of the museum that's associated with the dueling dinosaurs um called cretaceous creatures so if there's any middle schoolers you know watching right now it's a program for them where we'll find the the sediment and the mud and the fossils out here. And then we're, our, our mission is to send it off to your schools so you guys can have like lesson plans and days where you can look through real material to find real fossils and identify them. So yeah, check that out. It's a plug for, Cret for Cretaceous Creatures, so. Yeah, and I think uh, the website for the Cretaceous Creatures is getting ready to launch in about a week. Uh, and then the whole program itself is getting ready to launch uh, October 1st. Oh, wow. It's just around the corner. Just around the corner. I, I'm glad you brought that up because like the between the big dinosaurs that you're looking for and the the micro fossils, it really uh, gets at this idea that paleontology is so much more than just digging up and exhibiting big skeletons, that it's about learning about the, the way the entire world used to be. Exactly. You want to see a bone? Of course. Of course, we want to see a, a bone. There's this right Let's here. Let's see if the camera can find it. Can it focus? Is it focusing? Uh, you might move it back a little bit. That's a little better, yeah. And it's in the light can... a little bit there. What oh, hello! That? There we go. <laughs> Is that cool? Does that look? Does that show up? That it looks amazing. No way! Cool. Yeah, I got a macro lens on the screen, so. Hey, well, Ale, what is this bone? Okay. This, as you can see, has large pits, has large pits and furrows and ridge. This is a diagnostic character, so something that tells us that these features probably belong to a crocodile. Uh, in particular, these things are the structures that happen to be in the, in the shell of a, tr uh, in the armor of a crocodile. But one interesting thing is that the opposite side, the one that is not rugose, that doesn't have the spits and doesn't have those ridges, has some sort of furrows, has some sort of uh, concavities. So this probably was a part of, it, of the armor that was covering the top of the skull. So it was part of these bones that would have surrounded the top of the skull of a croc. And so we can understand a little bit more about where it was sit in the anatomy of the croc and also identify the kind of croc that these uh, bones belong to. That blows my mind. That is incredible. No, yes. one that like you found it. And but then also that this tiny little piece of bone gave you so much information about this animal. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. This is called comparative anatomy. So when you know enough about the general anatomy of different animals, even if you have some fragmentary pieces, you can try to locate like in a puzzle, which bits and which prongs belong to one specific area of the anatomy of the animal and then reconstruct the aspect and eventually the ecology, anatomy, biology of this animal. <clears throat> All off of little pieces of bone. Yep. Yep. That's amazing. Okay. Let me throw some questions and comments at you from our viewers in the chat. Uh, Michael wants to know if you found any new species at this location. Uh, not so far. So everything we found uh, is related to known animals uh, that we've known have been from this particular time period. So nothing uh, that we can uh, say is a, a new species yet. Okay, there you go, <laughs> Michael. Um, and then do you, or will you be donating some of your fossil findings to the museum? Well, we collect on behalf of the museum. So 
these these uh, particular fossils. So we're working on BLM under a BLM permit, uh, Bureau of Land Management. Uh, and these fossils will be held in perpetuity at the museum for uh, researchers and people to come look at. Um, and so they, they will be going to the museum. Everything we find goes to the museum. And that means that they go to you, the people of North Carolina. That's exactly right. I'm glad you asked that question, Michael, because it's really exciting that uh, when all of these fossils come out of the ground, they all come right back here to Raleigh, North Carolina, enter into the paleontology research collection, and then scientists like the three on the call right here do the work of sifting through them, sorting them, studying them, working on them, uh, anything that needs to be done to help us learn more about those animals and the ecosystems they lived in. Uh, there's a comment here that I think is for Ale from uh, Gabriella. Say hi to my brother that he's living the best life. <laughs> <laughs> hi, right on. How's it going, <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Uh, so how long will you be in the field? What's the plan for your remaining time out there to try to look for more dinosaurs, get these ones you've got dug up uh, and secured to come back to the museum? How's your the time look? Yeah, so we're we'll be out here till September 10th. Uh, and during that time, We'll get these jackets, uh, get these fossils uh, jacketed, which means we put uh, a protective uh, cap around them of plaster and burlap. We'll take them out of the rock. Uh, and then once we're done here, then we'll sort of reclaim the site. Uh, if we don't finish everything this year, we'll reclaim the site and come back next year uh, to try to find more. Um, so that's one thing we got to do. The other thing is we got to try, try to find some more of those microfossil sites. Uh, and collect sediments for the Cretaceous Creatures Program. Uh, and then once we're finished on September 10th, and we pack up camp, uh, we drop this guy off at the airport in Billings. Uh, and then uh, Haviv and I will drive from Montana back to North Carolina to bring uh, a whole bunch of fossils uh, from the entire trip from May till now uh, back to the museum. It's going to be a heavy caravan. <laughs> yeah, that's all. That's going to be a lot of wagons hitched up to get back to the oh, museum yeah. with everything. <laughs> and uh, from our earlier updates with uh, with Lisa Herzog and with Lindsay, we learned that uh, some of these uh, fossils coming out of the ground are big. Like some of these things were helicopter lifts just mm -hmm. to get them off the hillsides. That is correct. Uh, hopefully we don't have to uh, schedule a helicopter for this. I mean, it is a baby. So we're trying to right now play uh, the best game of pickup sticks we can because all these bones are sort of jumbled. Nothing's in life position. Um, so we got bones on top of bones and we're trying to just pull off pieces and make smaller jackets that we can throw in our backpacks and carry up the hill back to our camp. Uh, but you're right. Earlier this year when we started out uh, in New Mexico, uh, we had about 2,000 pounds of fossils that we loaded into helicopter nets and flew out uh, to camp. And so, uh, like, Ale, I know you don't work for the Museum of Natural Sciences. You've got your own appointment. Right. How does it work out for paleontologists like this to collaborate and work together in the field like you're doing now and then once you get back and you're actually getting data off of the right. fossils so yes you're right i'm from i'm associated with the university of vigo where i work and uh, this is in spain an institution in spain where i work on uh understanding how climatic changes affected dinosaur evolution a large scale uh, both in time and space so one key aspect of my work is actually analyzing data uh, putting together theory about evolution, how things work with quantitative measurable uh, studies that can make us understand better and test hypotheses on dinosaur evolution. But one essential part of my work, it's not only staying in front of a computer and crunching data, the data has to come somewhere. So I have to give a contribution in the field to get this data out, uh, enrich and expand the data set that we have on these creatures and on this time interval and on this area 
to better understand and fill some of the gaps that can't be compensated by any new analytical methodology. So one aspect when I fly back and when I'll uh, get back to my office will be possibly collaborating with these guys and getting a better picture of what's going on with the data and integrating them in the current paleontological knowledge to understand the patterns of evolution through time for these dinosaurs and these animals in this area. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. I have to think, I believe, I have to believe that getting out in the field and actually doing the work of finding them, prospecting, excavating uh, the fossils just lends so much more richness to the work when you do get back to the office. Right, that's correct. And it's also a great human experience. You get to collaborate with people that you wouldn't have thought of knowing. And these people are great. And you can always learn from other people. And this kind of uh, mixing and uh, collaborating with different people from different areas, museums, institutions is a great aspect of our discipline. I love that. I love that. Uh, with a few minutes that we've got left, uh, for folks who might be interested in paleontology, either as amateurs or people interested in becoming professional paleontologists, what's the what's the life like being out there in the field looking for dinosaurs? Itchy. Uh, yeah. Itchy yeah. right now. Uh, Itchy right now. But, um, but it's great. I mean, if you don't mind uh, spending some time outside living living in a tent, uh, I mean, I think our camp is pretty cushy. Uh, we we don't eat MREs. We we cook our meals every night. Um, and it's just great. And the camaraderie is, is wonderful. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, the life of a field paleontologist is is a really great, great life to live. I mean, it looks pretty exciting, I'd have to say. Yeah, it is. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Even just hanging out in those landscapes, like uh, it's gorgeous out there. Yeah, I don't know if we can take you to a tour. I'll be, huh? Uh, if you, we can take them to a tour uh, oh. around the hill. but Yeah, do you want to see more? I mean, you, you might have, have to. I've got time. Depends on how much longer you want to stand out there in the nets. Uh, I'm cool with whatever. I can, yeah, I can pick up the iPad and show y'all. I don't know how how much. Uh, jiggly. It might. Yeah, it might be a little jiggly. But let me let me see if I can get this oriented towards the beautiful mountain behind us. Uh, I don't know if you can see that hill. Can you see that hill? Yeah, over your shoulder there. Yeah, let me try to stabilize it because that's that hill is really important. It's really cool. Okay. I think that I'm, might be a stable. I'm curious about this hill now. Well, do you right. see that dark black band? Uh um, it's a it's a little fuzzy on my screen, but maybe I can make it out. Like about two thirds of the way up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ollie, do you want to, so you want to say that? If yeah. you see that black coley line, horizontal line across the whole hill, this is exactly the layer that was deposited 66 million years ago when the asteroid hit the planet. So mm. you've got lots of huge fires going around. That's why you got the coal. And if you analyze chemically those rocks, you do find lots of minerals that are non-common in our planet, in our Earth crust, but they're super common in asteroids. And that was one of those lines of evidence to point towards an asteroid causing the extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. And you can see it there. And one cool thing, as I was saying, that we are really, really close in uh, height, in topographic height in this hill to that band, meaning that these craters that we're digging up now and these triceratops probably was one of the very last triceratops, one of the very last dinosaurs that maybe saw there's stars falling from the sky, and then the world completely changed forever. <laughs> that, that, is a, that is amazing. And so what, uh, like what preserves that, the record of the asteroid impact uh, and that, that it's like it's here, but is it other places as well to, yes. to give you that, that evidence? As an Italian, uh, I'm proud of saying that the, the story of extinction started off in Italy. 
when some geologists studying rocks in the middle in central Italy found some of these minerals, some of these weird space minerals in a layer that was dating 66 million years ago, where they were seeing some weird patterns where some microscopic creatures, some sea creatures, uh, very tiny ones from the plankton, were going completely extinct. And then only a few were surviving in an interval of a few thousand years. That kicked off eventually this enterprise to understand where this space mineral was coming from. And the hypothesis was that maybe a supernova, maybe a comet, maybe an asteroid came uh, and brought these things on land. But then eventually layers like here in the Hell Creek in Montana, but also in Denmark, in Spain, in Haiti, in other parts of the world, were sort of matching this pattern of extinction, this space rocks horizon, and then new creatures arising. And eventually uh, we understood that these same patterns uh, coincided with the extinction of the dinosaurs. And we found a huge crater, 200, um, I think it's 200 uh, kilometers wide in uh, the Gulf, what is now the Gulf of Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula, in a, locality, in a locality called Chicxulub. And these rocks, uh, the rocks bordering this impact crater were dated 66 million years ago. So people thought, bingo, that's actually the match. That's the, that's the bullet that killed off the dinosaurs. What a story. I know. That's, that's amazing. And that you've got evidence of it right there. I think we have like a tiny little piece of it on exhibit here uh, in the Fossil Hall at the museum as well. So if people are local to Raleigh and want to come see a piece of the Cretaceous extinction boundary, uh, get up with me. I'll show it to you myself. I'll take you oh, right to it. Gary collected that. Yeah, Eric. Yeah, I remember yeah, a few years ago, we collected a, a much bigger piece of the what's called the KPG. It's known as the Cretaceous Paleogene Boundary. Uh, and so uh, as part of uh, what's going to go on display related to the dueling dinosaurs, uh, we'll have a nice section of that so people can see uh, the line uh, where these minerals that Ali was referring to uh, are sort of concentrated. That's awesome. That's just fascinating stuff. So uh, let's see. I don't want to keep you folks too much longer. I know you've got a long day's work ahead of you, being a, a couple hours ahead of us in time. Uh, any thoughts that you can leave us with? Any thoughts? Uh, uh, check out Cretaceous Creatures. There it is. Yeah, we can, we, can, we can plug the projects. Yeah. Stay tuned for uh, the opening of the Dueling Dinosaurs exhibit uh, in fall 2023. There you have it, everybody. We're really excited about that. I'm very excited about this Cretaceous Creatures project that's going to be coming up soon. So uh, middle school students and educators get up with us here at the Museum of Natural Sciences to learn more about that. Uh, Eric, Haviv, Ale, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for checking in. Thanks for thanks chatting for with us. us. Yep, thanks it's been fun. You. Bye. Loved the stories. Loved getting to see what you're working on. And folks, thank you for tuning in to today's live update. We had a great time. Uh, keep an eye on naturalsciences.org, the museum's website, and our social media channels, at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find updates from paleontology, and a lot more of the science that happens here at the museum all of the time. Uh, and if you check all of those out, you can find how to follow our paleo team themselves on Twitter and Instagram, where they're posting photos and updates from their expeditions uh, from all summer long. There's a great archive of stuff there, and they're going to be there for a few more days. So uh, you'll want to keep an eye on stuff like that, too. In the meantime, Tonight, if you're local to Raleigh, we're going to be showing The Lost World, Jurassic Park, in the cool. movie, in the museum's WRAL 3D theater. Uh, paleontologist Lisa Herzog is going to be with us tonight to talk about the quote unquote science in the movie or the That's not awesome. so science. <laughs> oh, right on. <laughs> we're going to we're going to debunk the lost world with a paleontologist. There's also going to be food, drinks and activities available before the movie starts at 7. Uh, so 5.30 p.m., come on out to the museum. Tickets are still available on-site and online, naturalsciences.org. Uh, 
And uh, Eric and team, stay safe out there. Take care. I, I wish a strong breeze to take all the gnats away from you. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll send that your way. Right on. <laughs> Folks, thanks for tuning in today. We'll see you again soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.